Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're uh, able to enjoy the sunshine and the warm weather that we're having this weekend. Get outside and enjoy it. This week is the first part of a lesson about Pentecost, because next weekend is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, so I guess we should start by talking about what Pentecost is and why we're talking about it. Uh, so at the time of Jesus and the apostles and when the, our, uh, the Gospels and everything were written, um, the Jews of the world, the diaspora Jews, so Jews living outside of Jerusalem, would come and gather in Jerusalem for this big celebration, this Pentecost, which happened 50 days after Passover. Uh, so there would be a lot of people in Jerusalem celebrating uh, they would also call it the Festival of Weeks. It was a pretty big deal. Uh, it was one of several festivals uh, each year where you know it brought a lot, a lot of people together to, to worship and celebrate uh, and give thanks um, for harvest or, or what have you. So um, the stage is set for this with lots of people in the area, mostly Jews or people that converted to Judaism, uh, and then you have the apostles and many other people, followers of Jesus, gathered in a room together. Um, and uh, this is where our verses are going to take place. So we're working out of Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 41. So it's kind of a long passage, so bear with me. Uh, I would encourage you guys to read along in your Bibles or, uh, you know, whether that's on your phone or in a book. I happen to be working out of a study Bible. But read along because it's a lot, uh, and we'll go over little bits and pieces of it as we go. I forgot to tell you guys about the worksheets. They're still free for this weekend, next week. So go to the Findry. The link is down in the description. Just to give you an idea, this is out of one of my textbooks. And you see this map of the area, and you'll recognize as we read the passage a lot of these different places so they're spread out all over the area okay and for this festival they're gathering up in Jerusalem okay which isn't marked but it's in here in this area here okay so we're gonna read the passage and the heading in my Bible is the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. 
This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Praise God. 3,000 is a lot. So there's a lot in that passage. You know, it's pretty busy. Um, but... You have all these people from all over the place, right? I showed you the map. They're coming from everywhere. And they all speak different na languages natively. And when the Holy Spirit came into the room and came on these men, they started talking so that they could be heard and understood in all the languages that were present. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that's a powerful miracle. These men were from Galilee. They were fishermen and tax collectors. These were not people that would traditionally have known many other languages. They might have understood Greek and Hebrew, uh, you know, maybe a variety of other dialects, but to be able to communicate with all these people so that they could understand the truth that was being shared with them was just a, an amazing thing. And so we got to understand with this too, you know, it wasn't just a miracle making people talk in different languages and that was it. You have people from all over this map, right? All over the place. Gathered together in this place to witness this. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And guess what they're going to do after the festival is over? They're going to go home. They're going to go out to all the places where they're from. And they're going to take the gospel with them. Now granted at the time, of course, the gospels weren't ready for them to be taken physically. But they witnessed the event and they heard the truth proclaimed by Peter in his first big sermon in Jerusalem. They were able to take that with them, take it home, and the theme of fire in there is, you know, it's just, it's getting ready to spread over all over the known world. The gospel is traveling quickly, just like fire does. So it's pretty awesome, pretty powerful, and it shows the timing of God. God works through all these things for his purposes to accomplish his ends, not our own. He has all these people there gathered together, praying, celebrating on their own, uh, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So that's just really powerful. Now you notice that some didn't want to or just couldn't grasp what was going on. In verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. So they think they're just going nuts. And perhaps they couldn't understand them. Maybe their hearts weren't ready. They weren't prepared. It wasn't time for them to understand what was going on. So they didn't understand and they brushed them off as drunks. Um, but then you get the message from Peter and he describes what's happening. And you notice that Peter is quoting people like Joel and David. 
Um, he's referring back to Old Testament, to, to Scripture, to use that to educate people, to tell them, hey, this Jesus that you crucified and has arisen, we've witnessed this ascension. Um, this man that you crucified is the Messiah. He was talked about. It was foretold in here. And now you're witnessing all these things coming true from the Old Testament, from Scripture, from these things that these people, the Jews, meditated on, prayed over, and, you know, read very regularly. Um, and that, you know, it speaks to the power of the Holy Spirit first that all these people heard and understood and it also speaks to the Spirit acting through Peter and his ability to speak to the people and help them understand help them to grasp what was going on and how you know momentous this was so that they could come to believe and be baptized and take the good news, the news of, of hope, of a, a resurrected life, of a new life in Jesus, out to where they're from, and tell other people about it. So what we're witnessing here is essentially the start of Christianity, the start of the church. This is the first popping off of, a, of its missional purpose, right? We're supposed to go out and, and make disciples, and that's what they're doing here. This is the first mass movement of, of discipleship. They're sending people out. They've got the news. And here we go. You know, the church is rolling. It's going to spread all over the place. And then after this, through the New Testament, and you read further in Acts, and then in Paul's letters, um, how the early church is shaped and, and molded by these early leaders who witnessed things, who traveled with Jesus, who heard him speak, uh, and who knew intimately what he was trying to do. So the beginnings of our, our faith, you know, our, our church, you know, as a body of believers is, is happening right here. Um, so this is, this is pretty, uh, pretty exciting stuff. So I'd encourage you guys to just, you know, take your time and read through it together. Um, it, like anything, you know, anything worth understanding, you want to read it a couple times. Um, talk about it with with your friends, with family, uh, you know, anybody that will listen, uh, and just think about what you know what God is trying to do in this passage, what he succeeded in doing, uh, and what he wants us to take from this. Uh, you know, he, he blesses us. He gives us the ability we need to accomplish his purposes in the world, his purposes to continue to spread the gospel message, to change lives, to give people hope, to give people the knowledge that there's a, a chance of redemption in it, and it doesn't involve rituals and sacrificing animals and you know they're just they're not beholden to these shackles you know of this sinful life and listen to people in fancy clothes barking at them about the rules and the laws uh, you know there's there's salvation there's something beyond all that and having witnessed this these 3,000 new believers who are going to take that out <clears throat> to the world, you imagine that they're going to have some of that fire. They're going to have some of that fire that came down on the apostles and on the 120 that were gathered in the room, and they're going to take that out with them. And that, as you see today with Christianity all over the world, it's just continued to burn. Sometimes it smolders a little bit, some people even try to snuff it out, but you know what? That's not possible. It's not possible at all because no matter how many times the whims and the wills of man, of governments, of bad actors have sought to stop or slow the will of God, it never works. So have faith. Have hope. 
and just continue to pray and be faithful, love one another. And I want to send you out with this verse. I'd like you guys to memorize it, okay? It's a short one. It's an easy memory verse. Um, but I think it, it's good for this time, both what we're studying and what we're all going through together right now. And this verse is out of Romans, and it's in your handout. It's chapter 15, verse 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you guys later. I love you and miss you. Bye.